preservation of and increased access to the 92nd Street Y Humanities Audio Archives is generously funded by the National Endowment for the Humanities. Well, good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and uh, welcome back. I was just uh, speaking with Professor Yovel backstage and suggesting to him, and you'll understand this, those of you who were here last week, and that's about 95% of you, if he is 50% as good as he was this week as he was last week, we're going to have a lot of trouble uh, limiting the number of people who come. Um, before I reintroduce Professor Yovel, let me reintroduce um, Jay Goldberg, who is a member of the Board of Governors of Hebrew University and also Vice President of American Friends of Hebrew University, to share a few thoughts with you about the Hebrew University this evening. Jay Goldberg. Thank you. Uh, I'll try to be brief because for those of you that were here last week um, at Professor Yovell's talk, it was wonderful and we ran out of time, so I'm not going to take up a lot of his valuable time. Um, Hebrew University, as I mentioned, for those of you that were here, uh, has about 23,000 students, but there are some characteristics of the university that are unique, and I'd just like to mention a few of them to you. Uh, first of all is its unique faculty, an example of which you're going to see tonight in Professor Yovell. It's got some world-class researchers and teachers from uh, the State of Israel and visiting faculty from around the world. Second thing is uh, the Rothberg School for Overseas Students, which some of you may be aware of, but it's a wonderful school for American students and students from other countries outside of Israel to study in Israel, either on an undergraduate level or in some areas of specialty on a graduate level. For those of you who have children who are thinking about spending a year abroad studying in Europe, you might want to think about having them study at the Rothberg School because it's really a unique kind of educational opportunity for young people. And lastly, the city in which the university is housed is Jerusalem. And Jerusalem is, in my opinion, the most wonderful city in the world. And for any of you that are planning on visiting Israel, coming to Jerusalem, um, I'd like to tell you, please try to fit into your calendar a visit to the campus on Mount Scopus, which has some of the most beautiful views of the city in the world. Um, and it'll be a nice chance for you to see the university. It's a wonderful city, a great university and I hope you enjoy the talk tonight. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Goldberg. Um, I want to once again thank the American Friends of Hebrew University and uh, the Hebrew University for uh, co-sponsoring uh, this series with us this evening and uh, invite you, uh, well, invite you for several things. First of all, invite you for the beautiful nosh that they always bring. Uh, a reminder, not that we always need reminder of a little dessert afterwards, but you are cordially invited uh, for dessert and coffee following the lecture. And of course, Professor Yovel will be back there as well. And that takes place right behind you in the um, room just adjacent to us. Um, a couple of notes about upcoming programs, as I always do. Um, this Sunday, Rabbi Joseph Telushkin's topic is Words That Hurt, Words That Heal, a day studying the ethics of speech. And also, if you want to spend a few other Sundays with us, uh, Rabbi David Wolpe talking about the question of the Messiah and the afterlife in Judaism. Uh, in February, Dr. David Elcott talking about Islam, the background about Islam, what every person should know about Islam and the relationships between Muslims and Jews historically and today, and then later on, in May, an evening with Dr. Alice Shalvey, um, entitled, Now You See Her, Now You Don't, Judaism and the in Invisible Woman. Uh, Dr. Shalvey has been with us before. Anybody who has studied with her appreciates her tremendous biblical insights um, um, in, on, in a whole series of issues. This particular issue will be dealing with the role of women in Judaism historically. And as I mentioned last time, a couple of large evenings here with Malcolm Honline, uh, the State of World Jewry in January, uh, a series of dialogues that I will be conducting with Rabbi Tolushkin, our first interviewee, Dennis Prager, March 2nd, the week later, Anatoly Sharansky, March 8th, and then A.M. Rosenthal, um, March 23rd. So that's just a taste, and our courses begin in about in uh, early February on everything from uh, history, text, philosophy, Hebrew, Yiddish, you name it. We got it. You are welcome, and we'd love to have you. Okay, that's wetting the intellectual appetite. We've, we've uh, wetted the, uh, the, uh, the taste buds, perhaps, with dessert. Let me briefly introduce Professor Yovell. Since virtually all of you were uh, here last week, I will just remind us who he is. Um, he is, of course, a professor of philosophy at the Hebrew University of Jerusalem, where he also chairs the S.H. Bergman Center for Philosophical Studies. Um, I don't need to tell you that he's an acclaimed scholar and author of Spinoza and Other Heretics, 
We learned a bit about Spinoza last week, and he's had visiting appointments uh, at most of the major universities around the world. Uh, finally, he was a senior news editor with Israeli radio and hosted talk shows on Israeli TV and contributes regularly to Haaretz and Yidiot Achronot. Last week, the topic was Maimonides and Spinoza. Tonight, Moses Mendelssohn and Martin Buber. Please join me in welcoming back Professor Yermiyahu Yovel. Thank you, David. Thanks very much. Good evening. Um, I will uh, be conducting this uh, lecture as I did last time, handling this impossible mission of uh, dealing with two great uh, thinkers in one hour. So uh, the one that would suffer <clears throat> today, uh, tonight, uh, I'm afraid, would be Martin Buber, uh, because he comes second, just as Spinoza suffered last week. But I will do my best <clears throat> to address some of the main issues in his thought, too. But first, we have to uh, speak about Moses Mendelssohn, who is, uh, in many ways, the father, the initiator of uh, the Jewish, of Jewish modernity, in many ways. Moses Mendelssohn, as, uh, is, as many of you, uh, I'm sure, know, was a philosopher who was recognized by the German philosophical establishment, by the uh, leading philosophers in the 18th century in Berlin and in the whole of Germany as an equal colleague. That was a great feat for a Jew, a Jew born in a ghetto in a small town of Dessau uh, to perform. But it was part of his plan. It was part of his life project. As a Jew and a thinker, as a European and an intellectual. What was Mendelssohn's <clears throat> project? You might summarize it in two words, one Hebrew and one German. The Hebrew word is Haskala, the German word is Aufklärung. They, most, they more or less mean the same. In English, it would be translated enlightenment. However, the word enlightenment and the movement of enlightenment has many faces and many nuances. And when you say Haskala, which is the Hebrew word, you say something else. Not quite the same as when you say Aufklärung, which is the German word. Moreover, when you say Aufklärung, which is the German word, you do not quite say the same as Enlightenment in English or as Lumière in French, which is the French word for it. So it's not really the French word for it. It's the French word for something a little different. And those differences <coughs> are very important for understanding Mendelssohn. His project then was Haskalah and Aufklärung. It was Jewish Enlightenment and German-European Enlightenment, both taking different senses and different meanings, and yet combined in a way that makes them mutually complementary. As a Jew, born, as I said, in a small and a medium-sized town of Dessau, still you can visit it today. It was <coughs> formerly in East Germany. Uh, you can see his statue there and his and a place which was supposed to be, which was before his, uh, his birth, uh, birthplace and so on. You, he came out of Jewish education, traditional education, a very obs <coughs> observant community, quite close to the world, quite close to the great events that were going on in European culture at the time, as most of the Jews were. However, he followed by his, I don't want, I, I'm not going to tell his life here, uh, but some facts are necessary. He followed his rabbi, <clears throat> who went to become the rabbi of the Jews in Berlin. He came to Berlin, and in Berlin, he studied philosophy. He studied, he followed the trend of rationalism of his own time. And his aim once was in, this, in, in joining Haskalah and Aufklärung as a double enlightenment project, was to show first that a Jew can join and participate the general European culture, that he can do it without danger to his identity and to, him and to his religion. On the contrary, uh, he can do it in a more enlightened way. And on the other hand, he can excel 
in the culture of the nations, in the European culture. He can be a leader. He can not only assimilate or integrate into this culture, getting out of the intellectual and mental ghetto, but becoming a major figure and a leader in that European movement. We shall see in a moment the limitations of this ambition. The limitations were that he could do it pers as a person by using his gifts, but he couldn't go too far in, as, in being a leader because then he would frustrate another aspect of his project, which, I will, uh, which is more strategic and which I will discuss in a moment. On the other hand, uh, if he does, if he, uh, if he remains and he can remain Jewish in his observance, in his uh, way of life and so on, then he also passes a message to his, other, to his fellow Jews. He tells them, let us go out of the intellectual ghetto. Let us mingle with the European society. For him, European, of course, meant German. Let us learn the German, the European languages again, German. Let us become versed in science, in philosophy, in literature, in aesthetics, in art, all the things that Jews have been, uh, have been abstaining from or rejecting. Let's bring together European culture and pure reason and our Judaism into a combination that will, will enhance both rather than bring them both into contradiction. That was quite a momentous and ambitious uh, project because there is an internal tension between the two. I have spoken about it last uh, week with examples. But uh, we shall see Maimonides, uh, sorry, uh, Mendelssohn's uh, original and problematic way of putting these two together, which is very different from that of Maimonides. However, when he says he wants to join the European, that is the German society, he did not mean the German society as it was, because in many ways it was still backward, it was still intolerant, it was still bigoted, it was still uh, dominated, not by reason, by, but, but by all kinds of, uh, of privileges and, uh, and domination and anti-rational elements. So it's not the society as it was that he uh, sought to join, but there's the German European society as it ought to be. That is to say, as it ought to be, first of all, in itself, because it's a better, a more advanced human society, the one that he saw in the future, than the one that existed. It ought to be for the sake of its own character and for the benefits of its own citizens. And also, as it ought to be, so that a Jew can be accepted by it. It has to change, it has to become more tolerant, more open, more pluralistic, as we say today, more accepting than it was for a Jew to be able to fulfill this plan and, and integrate in that society. So that really dictated the way in which he wanted to join. He had to join the progressive minority in that society and not a not traditional, ordinary mainstream. He has to become a member of the progressive minority. The progressive minority in Germany of the time, intellectually speaking, not so much politically, but intellectually speaking, were the, those who, uh, the writers, the, the, the professors, the, um, the philosophers, the theologians, who belonged to uh, that movement called Aufklärung, German Enlightenment. Now, what did they want? They wanted also to make religion and reason uh, compatible. This is one major difference that separates the German Enlightenment from the French Enlightenment. You probably have uh, known such names as Voltaire, Diderot, and others in the French Enlightenment who were very anti-religious. They fought, they, they conducted a struggle against clericalism, against the religious tradition. They wanted reason to take over and to do away with traditional theology and religion. That was a major, a dominant theme in the French Enlightenment, which also then came to the foreground uh, later in the, in the French Revolution. 
Not so in Germany. The German Enlightenment, this is why we call it by its own name, Aufklärung, was more reconciliatory. It, it looked for religion to become more rational, more humane, more open, more liberal, but not to be eliminated. It wanted to make religion correspond to reason rather than erased by reason. Now, what does this mean to make religion correspond or come together with reason? Two things were part of their plan. On the one hand, to take the historical religion with all its mythologies, superstitions, I irrational ceremonies, uh, or uh, uh, the meddling of the, the clergy in politics, which was a big problem, still is, uh, in, in all countries, perhaps even in this one, um, and so on and so forth, to take these elements and purge them out of religious life, to make religion a more private affair, more liberal, more open, tolerant, and as little involved in those irrational elements uh, as possible to, to get rid of all the superstition, um, of all the politicizing, of all the uh, irrational elements. That is one way of making religion and reason uh, reconciled. The other way is when, after you have done that, you remain with a hard nucleus of religious beliefs and basic practices which have been purged out of politicizing, out of superstition, out of all the irrational elements, and they stand as the, so to speak, purged or purified core of religion, belief in God, belief in immortality, belief in, in some moral providence overseeing the world, and a few other things uh, that, are, that, are, that are crucial, uh, freedom of the will, of course, as a basis for universal morality, and so on, and some basic uh, practices, and also for the Christians, of course, belief in Jesus, uh, uh, belief in the incarnation, and a few others. And then that minimal, rational core of religion, rationalized core of religion, should be proven by reason. Reason, human reason, universal human reason, should be, which is not relying upon the revelation of God, not relying upon the Bible, relying upon itself, its own authority, should be capable of proving those religious truths, that God exists, that we are free, the will is free, that there is immortality, that there is some moral order, world order uh, governing uh, all things, and so on. That was the second R. So on the one hand, you purge religion of irrational elements. On the other hand, whatever is left, you, you, you call for the help of reason itself to prove that religion in that minimal core is right. This is basically uh, was the project. Mendelssohn adopted this project, not whole, uh, wholeheartedly, but as we shall see in, uh, later on, he gave Judaism a different place within this picture than Christianity, and thereby made Judaism for him uh, distinct from, uh, uh, distinct and, and having an identity of its own. I'll come to it a little later, but we still have to understand his general, uh, his general project. Now, another thing that must be uh, understood is that although uh, he had to join the progressive minority in German, in, in, in German culture, he also had to be very careful uh, strategically that as a Jew, he will not be marginalized. And therefore, within that minority, within the Aufklärung movement, he took a mainstream position and not a radical position. So on the one hand, he opted for a minority and he, he, he went against the mainstream of the society as a whole by opting for the progressive minority. But within his own camp of the progressive minority, he had to adopt a mainstream position there so that he would be more accepted he would be more tolerated. He would be more listened to. And he succeeded in that beyond hope. Partly because of his strategy, partly because of his personal gifts and character. He was not only a very sharp and deep uh, 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 thinker, he was 
uh, well, deep, uh, I should say, uh, very sharp and, uh, and highly intelligent thinker, but he was also uh, a very uh, socially acceptable man. He was liked, although he was uh, physically uh, rather deformed, but uh, that was not noticed because of the kind of personal charm that he uh, that, that emanated from him. He was liked uh, by many uh, of his contemporaries. Uh, Anti-Semitic Germans, of course, always accepted him, accepted also uh, as an exception. I mean, of course, every anti-Semites anti have always some Jews they admire, and Mendelssohn fulfilled uh, this role for quite a number of anti-Jewish thinkers in his own time. But he also attracted the, the love and the friendship of philo-Semites. The greatest of them was Gotthold Ephraim Lessing, the great German theologian and uh, playwright and, uh, and many other things. Uh, he know, he's known basically today as a playwright, but he was more than a playwright. He was a theologian. He used his own plays for ex expressing uh, modern, very daring, very extremely daring for the time, theological uh, ideas. Uh, who became very friendly with Mendelssohn. They were personally friends, and then they, they had a very interesting correspondence because they didn't live, uh, uh, Lessing didn't live in Berlin. He lived uh, in Wolfenbüttel and other places. And eventually, uh, Lessing wrote one of his uh, most uh, well-known plays, which is called Nathan the Wise. Nathan the Wise, about uh, a wise Jew uh, who lived in the day of the Crusades and so on, and I won't tell you the story, but uh, uh, the idea is that that Jew incorporates all the virtues of humanity in general. You look at him, he is a Jew, but above all, he is, before being a Jew, he is a human, human being. The virtues of humanity in a universal sense are all present in him, and therefore, he is uh, admired and loved. And uh, this shows that a Jew, despite all the negative stigma against Jews that were very, very strong in the Christian mind uh, uh, everywhere in Europe at that time, um, despite the, those uh, stigmata, uh, a Jew is, first of all, a, can be, is first of all a person, a human being, and can be quite a, ra a moral, wise, radiant uh, human person uh, for them, despite or even though, even though he is a Jew. So very interestingly, for those of you who, are, who want to pursue this, uh, although Lessing became one of the great philo-Semite writers and one of the great spokesmen for toleration in Germany, as was Mendelssohn himself, still he never says that uh, Nathan has to be accepted as a Jew. He always has, says Nathan has to be accepted as a universal human being, that is to say, despite his being a Jew. And that's a great difference. Uh, in his case, which is very interesting and perhaps also topical to our two debates today. He was a great spokesman for toleration, but certainly not for pluralism, because his toleration was based upon the idea that all people share some universal human virtue or human feature, and that we have to relate to them as universal people, as men, qua men, and not as Jew or Christian or Protestant or whatever they are. So there is, it's, it's a very strong, clear-cut uh, example of toleration, uh, which is anti-pluralistic. And that was very uh, common in the Enlightenment. Mendelssohn himself was very prone to take this idea, even though later on he had to speak for some specific, some partic particularistic uh, identity, which is the Jewish identity, and we'll come to that uh, in the second part of, of my talk. Now, uh, Nathan was Mendelssohn. Everyone knew that the model which uh, Lessing has taken for writing Nathan the Wise was, was actually Moses the Wise. 
And uh, but Mendelssohn's uh, influence and fame were not dependent solely upon that, but first of all about on uh, his own writings in philosophy. He became one of the leading philosophers of the time. Again, very interesting, not a great innovator. One might say rather not, except in, a, in aesthetics, and I'll have a, way to say, a word to say about that, he was not a great innovator. What he did was to take the current philosophical trend, which was more or less based upon the philosophies of two German, great German philosophers, uh, Leibniz and Wolf. These were the two progressive philosophers uh, of the time. They have set the model of rationality, the paradigm of what reason means. You remember last, those of you who were here last week, I said that when a Jewish thinker opts for reason, the question is, this next question is, what is the paradigm for reason? What kind of rationality? And I mentioned that there is Aristotelian rationality, which Maimonides followed. There was a Cartesian rationality, which Spinoza followed. Now there was a new paradigm for rationality set by these two philosophers, Leibniz and Wolf, which Mendelssohn followed. And for him, the great thing, his great achievement was that he elaborated and developed the current philosophy of uh, his time. The, 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 the Leibnizian, Wolfian philosophy, and applied it to new domains, such as politics and aesthetics, but he was no revolutionary, no innovator. In that too, he was in the mainstream of the minority. He opted for the Aufklärung, but was in the very mainstream of that minority. I'm saying this because there was another name, a great name, in German philosophy at that time. And uh, more or less Mendelssohn's contemporary, and that was Immanuel Kant, who became the great revolutionary and who <clears throat> kind of reversed the whole philosophical culture of his time, including Mendelssohn's own philosophy. And uh, he created a new phase in the German Enlightenment, which is uh, usually no known as the critical philosophy or the critical enlightenment. Mendelssohn, the critical enlightenment, uprooted the philosophies of Leibniz and Wolf and created a, a whole new philosophical universe from which we still are, uh, by which we still are, 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 many of us are still inspired, at least in part today. That was the great, uh, Kant was one of the, great, the greatest names in the history of philosophy. He can be compared to Spinoza, to Plato. Uh, Mendelssohn was a minor figure compared to, uh, to Kant. But as, as things happen uh, in their early careers, uh, once there was a contest for the best essay uh, declared by the German Academy, by the Prussian Academy in Berlin, and uh, Mendelssohn won first prize to Kant's second. So uh, these things uh, also happen. This has established a kind of a friendship and a very uh, un, uh, and a very subtle rivalry between them that went on. A deep friendship, a deep, a deep uh, appreciation, but also a rivalry and uh, and and uh, certain psychological problems between the two men. Uh, which uh, went on uh, until Mendelssohn's death and beyond. And if I have time, I will refer to it because this is a fascinating chapter uh, in the history of ideas and the history also of, of encounters between Jewish thinkers and uh, non-Jewish thinkers. Depends on my, my time. Now, another name that has to be mentioned in this context, another philosopher, of course, was Spinoza. Spinoza, I didn't have enough time last uh, week, but you got the gist of it. He was a great heretic. He was considered a, a heretic and a dangerous thinker by both Jews and non-Jewish philosophers uh, uh, equally. 
He denied that God was, he denied the personal God, he denied the creator God, he denied even that minimal, uh, uh, minimal uh, core of beliefs that the uh, Aufklärung uh, admitted and proved for religion. It was very dangerous to be identified with Spinoza, even if you weren't Jewish. Spinoza had quite interesting influence in, uh, in those days, but it was all clandestine. Nothing openly, nothing in universities, many in anonymous tracts and essays and so on. He was a dangerous fellow and had people took their distances from him, either because they really, most of them, uh, were enraged by him or because they agreed with many things that he said, but were prudent not to show it. Mendelssohn, for Mendelssohn, it is true to say both. There were things in Spinoza that actually enraged him, that actually he did not want to accept, that went against the, against the grain of his own understanding and, and, and of his own philosophy. And there were other things which did affect him, which he did accept, which influenced him quite deeply and which he did not want to admit because it was too dangerous. Both things are true. The main thing that he rejected in Spinoza, two main things he rejected in Spinoza. Uh, first, Spinoza's own rejection of a creator, of, 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 of a God separate from the world. For Leibniz, uh, that was essential. And the second had to do with the concept of the commandments and free will. Leibniz admitted free will to Spinoza's denial of it, and he believed that the free will has to be used by Jews to continue observing the Jewish commandments, uh, which even though, even though the tension between reason and those commandments was very great, and uh, he had to deal with it. Spinoza, of course, as we saw, Maimon, uh, Spinoza, of course, as we saw very briefly, rejected the commandments. He rejected the idea of uh, the Torah being given to Moses by God on Mount Sinai. Mendelssohn wanted to keep that. And he says that had Spinoza only continued to live according to the Jewish law, then whatever his ideas about God and metaphysics and physics, all his other ideas, which are also heretical to many, would not have counted, would, would, be, would be meaningless. He would have uh, been accepted by, uh, by uh, the orthodox Judaism on the basis of the mitzvot, the commandments alone. Whether this is true or not, uh, it's very hard to say. Uh, very hard to say. Now, there is a place. Now, uh, in, in, all our, in, in most other respects, Mendelssohn accepted Spinoza, um, was deeply influenced by him, and did not want to show it. And that problem uh, haunted Mendelssohn from his early youth to his very last days. Actually, perhaps it even uh, helped uh, bring him to his death, as I, as I will uh, uh, report in a moment. In an, in an early essay, he says, "Well, he says Spinoza, of course, is wrong. Spinoza, it was you had you had to take your distances from Spinoza." So he says, "Spinoza, of course, is wrong. Spinoza had so many uh, mistakes, but he was important because his mistakes helped to advance philosophy." That is a roundabout way of paying homage to a very dangerous man, and it is pertinent. It tells us more than the surface does. Now, another name and that I have to mention before I move to, um, uh, to uh, Mendelssohn's uh, core ideas about reason and about uh, Judaism is a uh, Swiss uh, Protestant fanatical priest who 
thought himself as part of the Aufklärung, of the, of the Enlightenment, was accepted, uh, was running around Berlin and uh, knowing everyone. And he challenged openly Mendelssohn, when Mendelssohn was already at the height of his fame and prestige as a leader of the German Enlightenment, and accepted as one of the main spokesmen in uh, Germany and in Europe for this movement of uh, rational uh, enlightenment, this Lavater challenged uh, Mendelssohn openly in the following way. Quite brutally, he was a pusher and he was, uh, he was also a kind of a nag in a way. Um, he said, he wrote letters to Mendelssohn, which he published. And he said, Mr. Mendelssohn, you have an obligation to us as a leader of the Aufklärung. Either you prove to us, why do we remain a Jew? Either you prove to us by rational argument that Judaism is superior to Christianity or convert to Christianity. That's the, that the dilemma, the, the dilemma he, he gave him. Either you prove to us with reason, as a member and spokesman of the Aufklärung, that your Judaism is superior to our Christianity, let reason prove it. If you fail to prove it, convert. Mendelssohn was deeply embarrassed. He was not embarrassed intellectually. That was an idiocy for him. He didn't think much of Lavater. He was embarrassed publicly, strategically. His whole project, his whole attempt to show that, uh, that Enlightenment and Judaism go together was challenged. And it was challenged in an unfair way. Why was it unfair? Because he was Jewish. Being Jewish, he was his situation was fragile. He was accepted, he was respected, but to a point. He never attacked Christianity. He never said anything to provoke his Christian colleagues and friends. Now this Lavater now wanted him to attack Christianity. He wanted him or to, be, to betray his own beliefs and identity. Uh, or to attack Christianity in public and to show that Christianity is inferior. Now, had this been a fair debate, say, in, in a free, open society uh, in which Jews live, I cannot give examples. Um, maybe I can. If it had been fair, if Jew, I mean, in a society where a Jew would not think twice before attacking Christianity, then Mendelssohn would have welcomed the debate and, uh, and, and followed it. He had arguments, and I'll tell you about them later. He did have very strong arguments as far as he was concerned. I, I don't think that it was, I personally don't think they were strong, but he thought he had very strong arguments. He didn't want to, he didn't want to, to come out and provocatively uh, voice them. That was very reminiscent, for those of you who know the history of medieval debates, where some pope or prince, some ruler, called in the rabbis, organized a debate, put Christian theologians on one side, on the one side, Jewish rabbis on the other side, and had them, uh, and had them uh, uh, debate which religion is, is, is better. Again. Apparently, it's an open, open-minded, fair debate. Practically, it was not. The Jewish side was always the fragile side. Suppose they do something wrong. Politically, it was a very, very difficult situation. Mendelssohn answered and evaded the question and did all kinds of things. And then many people joined the debate and took sides, some defending Mendelssohn, some attacking Mendelssohn. On the whole, it took, it took a whole life of his year and great energy to get rid of this particular nudnik. The, but he did not get rid of the problem. The problem actually really interested him. And Eventually, 
he came out with an answer of his own, to which I'm now uh, uh, coming uh, close. Before I tell you what this answer was, I want to say something about his writings on non-Jewish uh, affairs as a, as a philosopher, as a member of the Aufklärung. There were two domains that have to be mentioned in particular. One was aesthetics, which I mentioned before, the theory of art and, uh, and beauty. That was a rage at the time. Aesthetics, you might know, is a fairly new discipline. It started at that time in Germany. A little in England, perhaps, in England before, but it really exploded in Germany in the 18th century. We do have aesthetical writings in Aristotle, in Jainas, in, the, in antiquity, very little in the Middle Ages, and then very little in the, in the, and then it explodes. That was the talk of the day. Every philosopher had to, had to write in aesthetics. Even Kant, who understood very little about art uh, and had a terrible taste in, in most arts, wrote uh, an, an essay on aesthetics that is one of the most genial that has ever been written, which shows that you do not have to be uh, a great connoisseur of art in order to write a great aesthetical tract. That was perhaps also Mendelssohn's case, a Jew coming from the ghetto, coming from not a, not a, not a poor ghetto, but a self-imposed ghetto, but where, arti where art, beauty were not important and were not part of his education. And yet he had some interesting and quite original and inno innovative things to say about the aesthetical experience. That was one of his contributions. The other contribution was, again, theology or metaphysics, in which he wrote some of the most brilliant and popular tracts to prove by reason some of the truths that are important to religion, at least to the Christian religion, that God exists and, above all, that the soul is immortal. He's, he wrote particularly one book called Phaedon, or Phaedon, named after one of the dialogues of Plato, also written in dialogue form, in which Mendelssohn gave a lengthy but very vivid and written in a popular, in a semi-popular language, proof of the immortality of the human soul, just as Plato did in the dialogue, in his own dialogue by the same name, only that Mendelssohn used a logic and a metaphysics that were developed by Leibniz in this Leibniz Wolf School rather than a Platonic argument. So you see, each, as I said last week, each generation, each era has its own paradigm of what rationality is, and his paradigm was Leibniz. Leibniz. That book, Phaedon, became a universal bestseller in Europe. It was published in one edition after the other in German, then was translated to most of the leading uh, continental languages and made uh, Mendelssohn's great fame uh, far beyond the limits of uh, Germany. That also was part of the project we were discussing, namely to prove by reason some of the main ideas that religion is also interested in. But now the question arises, what religion is interested in those, pro in those, in those uh, proofs? Christianity, of course, because Christianity demands of its adherents, whether Protestant or Catholic, demands of its adherents to accept, especially pro Protestants, where Protestantism, Lutheranism, where faith is the most important uh, element in, for a person's salvation, but also Catholicism, who has this elaborate catechism, the Christians demand of their adherents to believe and accept a certain set of dogmas concerning the soul, concerning the will, concerning God, God's existence, God's benevolence, God's omnipotence, and so on, concerning the Son of God, Jesus, etc., uh, etc. Et and belief in those 
truths, which are metaphysical truths. They are truths uh, not about morality, not about behavior, but truths about what there is in the universe and beyond the universe. So they are metaphysical. Belief in those truths is a condition for salvation in Christianity, and especially in, in Protestantism, which was the Christianity around him. Not so, says Mendelssohn, and now we come to his thinking about Judaism, not so for the Jews. The Jews, says Mendelssohn, do not require any belief in such metaphysical or theological truth as a condition for a person's salvation or what is in Judaism the equivalent of salvation, pleasing God, be, having, uh, attaining a high, a high religious degree, a high religious achievement. Judaism requires only, says Mendelssohn, observance of the commandments. This is all there is to the Jewish religion. He expressed those ideas in a book called Jerusalem, uh, which also became very popular and which had two parts. In the first part, Mendelssohn writes his ideas about the relation between religion and the state, religion and politics. He pleads for toleration. This is one of the major uh, texts of the time uh, discussing the idea of toleration. And he argues that religion should not meddle in political affairs, should not be organized as a power structure, as a power establishment. It should be completely voluntary, not only detached from the state in all possible ways, including prayer, but not even organized in its own domain as another power structure with political power within uh, the system that can, be imp that can impose its will upon its members. Of course, therefore, he objects to the use of coercion by religion in any way, either private or uh, collective. He objects to the use of excommunication, <clears throat> which is, was a powerful tool by clerics uh, to uh, make uh, adherents obey to their uh, political power, either, uh, and uh, of course, by implication to the Jewish equivalent of the excommunication, the cherem, which is a Jewish kind of excommunication. And when he objects to this, he knows and we know that he knows that he's thinking of Spinoza. Now, it's not an accident that he's thinking of Spinoza because Mendelssohn was deeply influenced by Spinoza's book, <coughs> Treaties, not his, uh, by Spinoza's book, The Tractatus Theologico-Politicus, where Spinoza discussed the relation between the state and politics, where, he, where Spinoza pleaded for toleration, for the freedom of speech, and freedom of thought and so on, all these values that democratic societies today take for granted, but at that time were, were, were absolutely uh, an absolute novelty and uh, in many ways a heresy. And Mendelssohn continues that, which is easy relatively, because they, they both agree on these, on these matters. Spinoza also says something, in, something interesting about religion. He said that historical religion not the religion of reason, which he advocates uh, for, for, uh, for those capable of it, but the religion, the popular religion based upon the Bible, the prophets, as I mentioned last uh, week, uh, is not related in any way to truth. It is only related to morality. Religion the popular religion, the religion based upon the Bible uh, emanated from the prophets who were men, natural men, who were, as I mentioned last week, endowed first with a great and creative imagination and second with a strong moral intuition, knowing what is right without knowing how to prove it. 
So they had an intuition, they didn't have an understanding, but they had an intuition of what is morally right. And they had the gift of translating that intuition into images, stories, and other uh, metaphors, uh, poetry, using their creative imagination. So the, Bible, the, the popular religion, the truth about the Bible, the inner word of God as embodied in the Bible, is really a call for justice and mutual help, for a certain moral way of life, which the prophets have intuited and translated into images using their creative imagination. There is no claim to tell us any truth neither about God, nor about the universe, not about creation, not about the history of the Jewish people. All these are fables. All these are artistic uh, ways of expressing, of expressing and translating a moral intuition. Therefore, says Spinoza, a true, a true popular religion, a religion based upon the Bible uh, and yet Univer and, and yet, which is universal, which is not, it does not belong particularly to the Jews or to the Christians or the, to the Protestants or the, the Catholics or the Calvinists or the, or the, to the Orthodox and so on, but can be, can be used by all these people, by all these different uh, denominations, uh, is this kind of popular religion that Spinoza wanted to create, a trans-denominational uh, religion of popular religion of reason based upon the Bible is concerned only with morality and not with any truth. Doesn't tell us anything, doesn't mean to tell us anything. And if you find seemingly uh, propositions, uh, that is to say, statements, which uh, seem to be telling you something about what there is and so on, they are fables. They are not. Uh, they are not meant literally. So, Mendelssohn accepts this view, but restricts it back to Judaism. He says, yes. Now, he does two things. Let me be more precise. He, 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 he takes this basic view from Spinoza, but he introduces two changes in it. First, he restricts it to Judaism only. Spinoza took it from Judaism in the first place, there were many rabbis in the Middle, in the middle Ages uh, who believed that Judaism is only about the mitzvot. Uh, Spinoza pick, picked it from them and opened it up from Judaism to all denominations. So Mendelssohn closes it back to Judaism and says, Judaism is not about truth. Judaism is about action, is about behavior. And the second change is we are not talking about moral behavior <clears throat> in a universal sense. Which, will, which would go for a Christian, for anyone. We are talking about that particular ceremonial behavior which we, the Jews, were told to, uh, to observe. So he comes to the following conclusion. The Jewish religion is not a revealed religion. It is revealed, but it's not a, re it's not a religion it's not a revealed religion in the sense that no truth has been especially revealed in it to Moses and to the Jewish people through him. The Jewish religion, the Judaism, rather than a revealed religion, is a revealed constitution or a revealed law. What the Jews are supposed to do is to follow that law. And that is what distinguishes them and gives them an identity of their own from all other nations. It is also what would distinguish them within the movement of the Aufklärung. Because in all other respects, our science would be the same as that of the Christians. Our theology, our knowledge of God would come from reason and not from religion. It would come from reason and not from revelation. So it'd be the same. We would have exactly the same true thoughts about God, free will, immortality, and so on, as the Christians will have of any denomination, because all of us will be arriving at those ideas through rationality and not through a particular revelation. 
In addition, we Jews will have also our own particular revelation, which has nothing to do with truth, nothing to do with science, metaphysics. It has only to do with commandments. We have our own commandments, which were given to us and only to us, and which we have to go on keeping as a condition of being what we are. Now, that is a neat division, too neat, one might say, too strong a dualism. <clears throat> if I have time, perhaps in the question period, <clears throat> I will have to criticize uh, this view, but I don't have the time, so I only have to uh, report it. It was also a roundabout answer to this nag Lavater, who wanted Mendelssohn to prove that Judaism is superior to Christianity, and he did so in this theory about Judaism being a revealed law and not a revealed uh, religion. How? Because he said, look, from the viewpoint of the Enlightenment itself, if you take the viewpoint of the Enlightenment, then Judaism is much, uh, is much better, much more convenient, if you like. Why? Because you, Christians, because your religion demands that you believe in certain metaphysical truths as a condition for salvation, you get contradictions between what your religion wants you to believe and what your reason can or cannot prove. So you get all the classical contradictions between revelation and reason is your part, is on your part, the, the Christian. We Jews are not commanded to believe in anything. So we don't have those contradictions. All we have to do is to follow a certain, quite a big, number of commandments. So from, a view, from the viewpoint of the Enlightenment itself, we are in a better position. He didn't say we are superior. We are more fortunate. Our religion con is, is more in concords better with the idea of Aufklärung and Enlightenment. He never said so in so many words, but if you analyze the book, you see that Lavater is getting, Lavater and through him, all the others, <clears throat> is getting an answer right there. At the same time, this theory, which I said was a little too mechanistic and dualistic, but that was Mendelssohn's theory, enables Mendelssohn also to, uh, to, to approach the Jews. That is to say, to speak not only in the name of Aufklärung, but also to speak in the name of Haskalah and tell his fellow Jews, look, we do not have to worry uh, that learning secular sciences, metaphysics, and so on would uh, do anything wrong to our religion. We do not have to be afraid. Let's to go out learned, learn uh, secular uh, sciences, uh, have education, learn German, be Europeans, integrate into European society, integrate into European science, and so on and so forth, because there is no threat to our Judaity from that, since science, metaphysics, have nothing to do with our religion. Our religion is only mitzvot. As long as we keep our mitzvot, we can believe in whatever reason tells us, and we do not have to worry. So let's go out there and become good Europeans without fearing that our Judaity would be lost. Now, that, of course, was very naive. The naivete became ironic and then tragic when Mendelssohn's own family, almost to the last, converted to Christianity. They couldn't take this artificial division. It was also, you know, the only one who didn't convert to Christianity was Abraham at first, the father of Felix, the composer. But then, when they discovered that the boy had such a great musical talent, Abraham consented to convert to Christianity to give Felix a career. They even gave him this other name, Bartholdi. And I, I was once in the Mendelssohn archives in Berlin, and I saw a touching letter of Abraham to Felix. Felix was then at the, at the height of his career, went to London, gave a concert. Uh, gave a concert. There was great reviews and great success. 
and he gave the concert under the name of Felix Mendelssohn. Now Mendelssohn, if, if you, Mendelssohn has in the meantime become a very big name, especially in this town, as was Mendelssohn's uh, wife from at Guggenheim, you know the name. And, but then Mendelssohn meant Mendelssohn, that was written with an H, and sometimes with a hyphen, meant uh, the son of Mendel. So it wasn't such a, wasn't at the time such a distinguished name, distinguished ringing name as it is today. And Abraham writes to Felix in London, he said, I hear that in the, I hear that you had this huge success and I congratulate you and so on. But I also hear that you were using the name Felix Mendelssohn. So what are you doing to my sacrifice? And that was very touching. Felix Mendelssohn in this country is known as Mendelssohn in Germany to this very day. They, they, uh, they, they very often insist on calling him Mendelssohn Bartholdi. In any case, coming back to the division, it was artificial for two reasons. An inherent reason and an external reason. The inherent reason was that it was just historically untrue that Judaism never demanded uh, beliefs of its adherents. Judaism, since Maimonides, we have talked about Maimonides, Maimonides above all wanted knowledge, knowledge of God is the most important mitzvah. And all along, except for very, very small uh, exceptions, Judaism also wanted belief, and not only religious observance. So that was historically incorrect. It was artificially uh, devised to make it possible. By the way, we had in Israel a very important figure uh, just died a few months ago, Professor Yeshayahu Leibovitch, of whose name some of you have, have heard, a great religious maverick and, uh, and dissent, political dissenter in Israel. And he also was very, very strong. He had a very strong voice. Everybody listened to him. And he also always said, Judaism is only about mitzvot. You can believe in what you want. He was a professor of science, uh, of uh, biochemistry at the Hebrew University. He believed in Darwin. He believed in all the things that science stands for. He believed in the Big Bang. Everything that uh, science stands for was no problem at all. Because for him, Judah, and he was a very fanatically observant Jew. Because for him, Judaism was only about mitzvot. He never acknowledged his debt to Mendelssohn, but he was a Mendelssohnian. Uh, and uh, Mendelssohn made the second mistake, I think, that he had believed that people can that normal people can be religious while discarding one of the major dimensions of the religious life, which is the cognitive dimension. That doesn't work. It didn't work for Jews. It didn't work for others. And, uh, and uh, it, uh, it worked for Mendelssohn personally, but uh, it, it worked for, for uh, Ishayahu Leibovitch personally. It does work for individuals, for individuals which have the force of maintaining it, it cannot work on a larger, more popular level. Finally, uh, another thing that changed since Mendelssohn was that, another two things that changed, were that on the one hand, assimilating into the German society and the European society in other, in other parts of the world, American society, French, drew many Jews outside of any Jewish uh, affiliation whatsoever, even though it was not only Haskalah, it was also the emanci political emancipation of which we can tell, talk some other time. It is that the governments of those countries that emancipated the Jews demanded of the Jews to define themselves only as religion, a religion, and no longer as a nation. So for that, Mendelssohn was not responsible. And the other thing is that a new modern Jewish existence has evolved in which quite the contrary to what Mendelssohn uh, believed is not based on a strict observance of the mitzvot. I think that we all know that most of the Jews in the world today do not uh, 
observe the mitzvot in any, uh, in any rigorous sense. Uh, and yet, they do carry a certain, sometimes very strong, affiliation to the historical heritage and the identity of uh, and the Jewish identity, uh, which is not mediated and not necessarily based upon uh, practical observance. So in these two ways, uh, Mendelssohn has been, if not refuted, then very strongly modified by, uh, by events later on. I don't have time to, to speak about Mendelssohn and Kant, although this is a fascinating uh, chapter. So I think I will, uh, I will, uh, we will uh, end our discussion of Mendelssohn here. And uh, since I still owe you a few ideas about Buber, let me, uh, let, let me just tell you that if Mendelssohn uh, stands at the beginning of the encounter of Jewish philosophy and German and German uh, uh, and the German culture. Buber stands at the most tragic uh, point of encounter. Uh, as a young man, he was a German nationalist. In the in the year sixteen during the war, he wrote very strong nationalistic German uh, texts, which later he wanted to swallow, but. He couldn't, so we have them. And uh, of course, he became an early Zionist, but very much opposed to the political Zionism of Herzl, who did not know anything about Jewish culture. For Buber, Jewish culture was the most important thing, more important even than a state. He joined forces with the Hadaam for this kind of a cultural Zionism. And in that sense, he was in opposition to the more political military uh, Zionist all, all, all along. Later on, when he was ejected like all the other German Jews from Germany, he came to Israel only in 38, very, very last, in the very last moment. Um, he became a spokesman, a major spokesman in Israel and before that abroad for the most uh, pacifying attitude towards the Arab problem, for the uh, the movement known as Brit Shalom, which was a movement in which, which sought to be as humane and as liberal and, re and conciliatory with the Arabs, with the Palestinian Arabs as possible. They even spoke at the time for a binational state, an idea which had no chance and collapsed. But today, there, there, is, no, there is new talk about confederation, which is perhaps another way of a Buberian uh, dream coming uh, back into the agenda. And um, at the same time, he was very adamant Zionist when Zionism was, was attacked by, by people whom he admired, like, uh, like uh, Mahatma Gandhi, uh, as a colonialist, imperialist movement, and so on. He wrote one of the most fantastic pieces of Zionist uh, uh, apologetics in, in the letter to Gandhi, explaining why Zionism was not and what it, what it actually was. As a philosopher, he stood for something that we call uh, the philosophy of dialogue. His main ideas, as some of you may know, uh, are based on the I and thou encounter in which two persons come into an intimate relation uh, which breaks the barriers of alienation and brings their inner subjectivity into direct contact. This is what he understood by dialogue. Uh, it's not just talk, but it's two persons uh, in a position of uh, inner meeting. Uh, many thought that this is mysticism because in his early work he even said that I can have a relation like this not only with, with, with other people but even with, with trees and, 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 and animals and so on, an idea again which comes back now to the discussion. And so he was, uh, <clears throat> he was called a mystic, but he was not a mystic for the very, in, uh, he, was, he was not a mystic in the, in the important sense, in the important following sense, mysticism usually is a fusion of the I with some, of the ego, of the I, of the, of the self, with some larger entity into which the self becomes <clears throat> united. Unio mystica, this is called, this is the essence of mysticism. A dialogue in Buber's sense is the opposite. If we are in, the, in a dialogical position, then I remain I and you remain you, and the dialogical position only 
enhances <coughs> uh, the self of each of the participants rather than obliterating it. On the other hand, <coughs> there is a mystical energy that there is not a mystical structure. The structure is anti-mystical, but there is a mystical energy. There is a mystical halo, a halo <coughs> around those ideas. And Buber did not conceal it. He went, on the contrary, uh, to the literature of Hasidism, which he compiled and which he used all those uh, Hasidic fables. <coughs> now, when I'm saying Hasidism, I mean Hasidism in the correct technical sense of the, of the mystical movement of the Hasidim with their tzaddikim, and not uh, in the sense in which the term is used in, in America, where any Orthodox Jew with a long beard is called a Hasid. Uh, some of them are misnagdim, and they are the very opposite of Hasidim. So Hasidim is only part of the Orthodox community, the mystical part. And he collected their, <coughs> he collected their stories, their fables and legends, in a very unhistorical way, was fiercely attacked by one of the, our great historians, Gershom Scholen, for his unhistorical uh, approach, but defended himself in saying, I never said I was a historian. I'm a existential thinker. For me, what counts is not what was historically true or not true. For me, what, it, what counts is the spiritual potential that I can find in those stories for, <clears throat> for us today. And if I interpret it in my own way, this is what I want to do, and this is how you should take it. So they were fighting on this, and both were right, each in his own way. There was no, there was no real dialogue between the philosopher of dialogue and his opponent. So uh, Buber was using this material uh, to demonstrate, again, this mystical energy uh, which, in which you do not speak to God directly. The whole idea, the whole cognitive idea, this is what links him to Mendelssohn, the whole cognitive idea, is there a God, is there not a God, does, can reason do something, say something about it? He says no. This is not a cognitive problem. Knowledge is out of the question. It is a practical relation of an ego, to an, to, of a self to another self, through which the divine can be discovered. In other words, you do not talk to God directly. You do not stand in a direct relation to, to a divine who, are, who is outside of human relations. You find the divine in a human relation, in a relation to some other, to some other human. This is what made Buber so attractive to Protestant theologians. Buber is very, very popular in Protestant countries <clears throat> like this country or in, uh, or, or in Germany uh, because there are lots of things which uh, connect him to liberal Protestantism of our time to the point that he was even called a Jewish Protestant, a very ambiguous uh, label, uh, to say the least. Uh, my time is up. I am ready to take uh, five to 10 minutes of questions, uh, unfortunately. And then if someone feels that they have a pressing question, I'll be available later on. Yes, please. <clears throat> Can you repeat the first part of the question? I didn't I didn't hear it. I think it was less. I think it was less. Buber's thought was not, was not determined neither by the idea of a true or false statement about religion nor by the idea of an absolute commandment. It was more or less, you, you evolved into the tradition and the mitzvot through the other, through your relation to the other, to the community, to the Eida. You evolved towards them. You did not stand in fear and trembling before some commandment which you just had to obey. That was not his approach.
there are, well, I, I don't say, I, I, I wouldn't say that he was a relativist, although there are many philosophers who are relativists. Philosophers are uh, a very diverse crowd, you know, and uh, they have all kinds of ideas, including relativism. Um, you don't have to be an absolutist to be a philosopher, but if that would be true, then most of philosophers today would be out of business, by the way. But, um, uh, but Buber, I wouldn't classify him as, as, as a relativist. I would say that, <clears throat> I would say that he doesn't start with, with strong cognitive or, or uh, 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 principles or, or, or absolute commands. He starts from the religious experience. And he works, and he says that the religious experience needs the other requires the other, it requires a certain relation to the other. Not any r relation to the other would give you a religious experience, but you need a relation to the other, the I-thou relation, in order to have a religious experience. And it, he takes it from there. This is from where the rest develops. This is, by the way, why Protestant liberals liked him, because they too wanted to start from something more down to earth, more, more experiential, rather than from some dogma. Yes. Yes, please. Well, Mendelssohn also read Maimonides, and he knew that uh, there is a sense in which you cannot pretend to know God's properties. And uh, of course, in Maimonides, you do have belief in God, but you have a belief in a God which is inscrutable, as we said last week. Um, so I think that he was borrowing something from this idea in which you have a voice and you have an authority. You do have an authority. As long as you are in the practical domain, in the domain of ought, do sollst, you ought, then you have the concept of, of an authority. But you do not presuppose a being behind that authority. You start with the authority itself. By the way, we do have a, a Jewish philosopher nowadays, uh, uh, Emmanuel Levinas in France, a very distinguished uh, uh, Jewish figure and, and philosopher today, who who, who takes a very similar idea. In other words, you have the ought precedes the is. You, quite the reverse of your question. You do not start with something that is, exists and is present in order to have an ought. You first of all, you start with the absence. You start from the ought, which is the aleph, the A of philosophy. And then whether you have presence or being and you, you don't is a secondary question. So really, re, really these people reverse the order. Yes. Uh, no, there was quite the opposite. I think that Kant read Jerusalem and used it and abused it. I didn't have time to, to speak about Kant. Uh, uh, Kant uh, used Mendelssohn's Jerusalem in order to downgrade Judaism. And uh, when Kant ranges the different religions on a scale from the lowest to the, to the top, he doesn't only put Judaism at the bottom, he puts Judaism outside of the scale of religion but also whatsoever because he says that the essence of religion is morality and the Jewish religion was not a moral religion, it was not a cognitive religion, it was a political religion. And he bases himself upon a misreading of Mendelssohn's Jerusalem. So I think that more than Kant, it was rather Kant who was influenced but in an in a somewhat abusive way by Mendelssohn than, uh, than, the, other, than the other way around. Uh, one thing, you are right, it was in the atmosphere of the time to believe in absolute moral commands. Whether they come from the human will or from the divine will is a different question. In Mendelssohn, they come from a divine authority. Uh, sorry, in Mendelssohn, the Jewish commands come from a divine authority. The moral commands come from reason. In Kant, everything comes only from reason, and the idea of a divine authority is out. 
Two more questions, please. I think I did. The concept of God is not, uh, is not uh, unknowable. It is not revealed by religion. It is knowable by reason alone. Religion has nothing to do with the concept of God. Reason has. And this is the Leibnizian kind of reason that can prove God's existence, can good, prove God's goodness, and so on. Later, Kant, towards Mendelssohn, the, the end of Mendelssohn's life, Kant came out with his epoch-making book, The Critique of Pure Reason, and he undercut all the proofs of God's existence, all the proofs of the immortality and so on, and he showed that human reason cannot prove those, and thereby he dealt Mendelssohn a death blow. Uh, Mendelssohn pretended, maybe, maybe he, not to have read Kant's book, but he knew what was in it, and he, was, he knew that, uh, that his whole world was kind of collapsing uh, uh, as a consequence of Kant's critique. Last question. No question. Thank you very much. Thanks for listening. For more information on the 92nd Street Y New York and all of our programs, please visit us at 92ny.org.